But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve, I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. We are almost halfway through the 2020 Australian Open. All of the uh, matches are completed through the end of the third round, so we've got the second week of play, in effect, ahead of us. Yeah, we're recording Saturday night in North America, and you'll hear this on Sunday morning. By the time you hear it, a lot of the fourth round matches will have happened, so we're going to st- steer away from any predictions about those matches that's not necessarily true uh we may have something to say i don't know there's a lot of show still to come okay we'll see tennis is starting now at 7 10 p.m here in canada so tennis has just started in australia for sunday's play the fourth round is starting but we're here to look back on what's happened so far the name of this episode is called i am not a tennis expert and uh we kind of feel that way Quite often. Mm -hmm. But some folks look to us as tennis experts and we always push back against that. No. But But who else is not a tennis expert? Camila Georgi, who is, mind you, a professional tennis player whose expertise should be far more vast than ours or any of the Twitter experts out there. This was ahead of her second round match between either Kuznetsova or Vondrosheva when asked... About the prospect of playing either. She said, I am not a tennis expert. She says that she knows one is right-handed and one is (laughs) left-handed. Maybe doesn't know which is which. But see, I can relate. I know you can. Because you still don't know what's going on with the Pliskovas. Right. And that's more willful, I would say. That's what Camila and I have in common. This harkened back to one of the great quotes in women's tennis in the past decade. I don't follow tennis. Woman tennis. And I don't follow tennis. That was the great Camila Giorgi at Wimbledon in 2018. When asked about playing Serena, she had literally no idea. On the face of it, you'd be tempted to think it's shady. But you really don't get that sense with Camila Giorgi. It seems that she's really just here for herself. And on some level, (laughs) it's admirable. No, she is a bit of an unusual, eccentric woman. And I believe that she is determined to not give the press what they want. And when, it's not even malicious. She's, no, she's not doing it. But when you have bankruptcy cases to have to deal with outside of the tennis court oh, and all wow. these et cetera stuff, it, it may be hard to take in other things. You know, the bandwidth. I come back to the... I keep coming back to the bandwidth. Hers just doesn't let in anything tennis yeah, related. No scouting whatsoever. This bit of messiness aside, there was a lot of actual mess in the woman's draw right in the first week and it uh got kicked it all started with the rematch of the wimbledon first round between venus williams and coco goff the rematch that nobody wanted and nobody asked for venus showed up in australia late because she was injured wasn't able to play the tournaments that she had planned ahead of time and it was a repeat of that wimbledon first round in that coco goff dismissed the Elder Williams, Mm. in straight sets. A lot of Venus's fans were apoplectic about the loss, apoplectic about the fact that they were even playing each other again so soon in another first round of a slam, and also not too keen on Venus's play in that match. Whereas I had a totally different takeaway from it. Honestly, I did not expect Venus to win that match. Does it make sense that a 39-year-old, having not played a match since the U.S. Open coming off an injury, should show up in Australia and beat Coco Goff. Like, Coco Goff just won her first WTA tournament in the fall. She's only going to be getting better. And what I saw from Venus was somebody who wasn't physically hobbled on court. Her serve seemed improved. She had made adjustments to the, the actual technique of the serve. She had four aces down the tee, which is probably more than she had all of last season. <laughs> Seven aces total. More aces than double faults, while she started very slowly, and it looked dire for the first three games, she picked it up. And yes, there were errors, but if I'm looking at this as 
as a picture of what's to come for the rest of the season, I was encouraged a little bit. Should she get some match play, be able to play deep into a tournament somewhere, win a couple matches, I can see her having better results. It wasn't a, a woe is me, gloom and doom kind of situation for me. These first few matches in Australia are obviously adding to the story about Coco Gauff. She excels on these big stages. She loves playing top players, women that she idolized growing up. She doesn't really seem to betray many nerves. We saw that against Naomi Osaka, which was a complete mirror image of their match in the U.S. Open. Coco was unable to get a hold of her nerves and her game in that match at the U.S. Open. That was not the case. <laughs> they went toe-to-toe for the first couple games, and then it was all Coco. And by that I mean Coco held her game together, put the pressure on Naomi, and Naomi completely crumbled and fell all the way apart. It was, quite frankly, an embarrassing performance for the number three seed and defending champion. There is no other way to describe it for me, because by the end of that second set, Naomi had gone away completely checked out mentally, and it was jarring to see somebody of Naomi's stature fall apart in in that way against a 15-year-old, even if that 15-year-old is Coco Gauff. Right. I don't know how much the Naomi match says about Coco's game and mentality. I mean, mentally, that's where she's really impressive, but she wasn't really forced to raise her game to the next level against Naomi. It was just a bad, bad performance. And Naomi knows that. Like, she was pretty devastated following the match. She apologized to her entire team, including her new coach, Wim Fissette. Right. I don't know why we're apologizing out here, but, like, people have bad days. I don't I don't like that. Apologize to them in person, if you must. <laughs> it's a bit strange to do it in press. I mean, you can do what you want. Like, I, I don't want to tell people what they can and cannot do. But it to me, it just it just isn't cute. But at the same time, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We want Naomi to be open and honest and continue to be so as she has been in the past now that she's a top player. That's something that we've talked about on this show. Yeah. This is something that she would have said two years ago. So the fact that she's still saying it, we may not like the look of it, but it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, I honestly like when a player comes into press and said, that was bullshit. I sucked. Because in many cases... When a top player loses to a lesser player, that's the story. That may not have been the story here, or we'll talk a bit later about Serena and Wang, Mm -hmm. but sometimes the top player just sucked. Yes, but something that I've always been about is wanting to analyze or talk about how the play of the opponent, even if they're a lesser opponent, causes the better player to lower their level. Yes. Because I think there's a necessary correlation between the two it's symbiotic it's a game between two people right and commentary misses that very often when when a player nets a ball or continually hits balls long past the baseline that's not always happening in a vacuum right that's not happening because they made a poor selection yes that's happening because they're being pressured well i want you to remember that when we mm-hmm. get to the serena segment sure, of the sure. show there's a balance is, is what i'm saying so the coco golf machine, which is I think what we can call it now, is fully revved up, and it's the position of this show that we want to pump the brakes. Stuff like this that exists around a 15-year-old makes us a little nervous, so just let's kind of tone down the the proclamations and the forecasting about Coco being an all-timer. So many things can happen in tennis. I hope this young woman has an amazing career. I really do. I just don't, I don't want to put all that out there. Marty Fish is out here saying there's no doubt that she's going to win a million thousand Grand Slams. Coco Goff herself says that her goal, her mission is to be the greatest of all time, which... I mean, I don't have a problem with that. If, if that's what you want and you're willing to work for it, why not? But I like that that pressure is sort of self-generated for her. And I I don't want to hear it from people like Marty Fish, quite frankly. What I don't like and what I don't understand is why is there an Australian Open tailored version of the Call Me Coco shirts at this stage of the process? (laughs) We saw saw the shirts in the box, in the player's box, and it's the Call Me Coco, but it's what, upside down? 
which yeah. is supposed to be a play on the down under stuff. The point, well, the point is that there is immense financial pressure on her to perform now. There wasn't before, but there is now. That's another another element. No, I think it's more so that there are a lot more people invested in her success. Yeah, that's what I mean. Stated differently. Okay. You make it seem like if she doesn't win this match, that people are going to be losing money. That's not the case. The point is that people are invested in her doing well. And so her physical health, her emotional health could be compromised based on those external factors. That's right. that's right. part of the story and the narrative of these young 13 to 15 year olds who emerge on the WTA tour and for whatever reason, be it burnout, be it injury, be it family situations, they go by the wayside. And w- I mean, really, we're only talking about this because it has happened many times in tennis. And we just studied the Monica Seles situation. Right. Which was a, a unique situation. But at one point, she was a prodigy who was treated in a way that we see prodigies spoken about now. It, it just gives me a lot of pause. And I'm sitting here just kind of hoping for it to not get ahead of itself too quickly because we've seen the pitfalls. This is all uncharted territory for so many people. Mm. And I can't see why erring on the, the side of caution isn't a better way forward than just barging through full speed ahead. The idea that Venus and Serena Williams are a success story and a template and as such reason for one to expect that their their offspring, Coco Goff, another African-American player, should then have great success in their footsteps, unabated. That doesn't make sense to me. Well, and they didn't come through unscathed either. They did not. Like the Venus and Serena situation is singular. It, it just is. Like, we can't just be making careless comparisons and expecting things to go the same, is all I'm saying. Yeah, so not to be a downer or anything. To be a double downer, the one of the big stories of the first few days was the absolute collapse of Team Canada, save for one veteran. Denis Shapovalov, the number 13 player, had a lot of momentum going in. His game has completely turned around through the back half of last year and early this year went out to Martin Fuchovic in the first round. A shocker. We saw a side of Dennis that don't really like to see. Some arguing with the umpire about what racket abuse means. Very, very wrong opinions about racket abuse, which was a bit amusing. He threw his racket quite violently. He was assessed a code violation. He goes up to the umpire and he's like, that's ridiculous. What are you doing? I did not break my racket. How is that a code violation? Do, and what do you say? Be better. Do, do do your job. I don't know. I I just imagine like Canadian teenager, like do your job, bro. Like it, it's absolutely mind blowing because the actual rules are that throwing your racket is racket abuse. How do you not know this by now? And to boot, he played one more point before having to change his racket because it was indeed unplayable. Mm, exactly. <laughs> so Dennis fell out in the first round. Felix Ojeda-Aliassim loses to Ernest Golbis in the first round. Golbis is putting together a, a nice little story at this Australian Open. He did lose to Guillermo Mofis in the third round yesterday, but it is cool to see Golbis back and motivated and seemingly happy. You're with jumping. Tennis. You're jumping the gun. We're talking about the Canadians here. Sure. He, ha- he has his bit. Oh, he does. Yes. Okay. So those two are out. Milos Raonic is still here in the fourth round. Took out number six, Stefanos Tsitsipas, which was a shocker. However, Milos's strengths played to Steph's weaknesses big time. He was absolutely pounding his serve and forehand, really picking apart Stefanos's return deficiencies, which have improved, but clearly still have a way to go. It's not just that Milos is still around. The fact that Milos Raonic can show up to an Australian Open, a tournament that he's had great success at before and win a few rounds is not surprising. It's the way he's doing it. He's looking comfortable. He's not losing sets. He's not looking like he's being pressed at all. His game doesn't look rusty. And uh, (laughs) it is and it isn't surprising that he's the last Canadian left. Dennis and Felix are still young. Felix Mm -hmm. was struggling big time coming into this tournament. And Milos' pedigree has never been in question. Right. And so given good health, we've said this all the time. 
just the past episode, we said the story of Canadian tennis the next two years going forward may be the juggling of the top male Canadian spot between or amongst Dennis, Felix, and Milos. That we didn't think that Milos was done yet. And here he is. Right. And there was a time in Canadian media that Milos got all the press because he was it for us. And now that you have these young, charismatic guys who represent a new generation, Milos was forgotten about. And he has played very little in the past two years. But it's super impressive to me that he can come back from a lot of time away, not playing a full schedule, and be at this level. Vashek Paswasil is another Canadian who I predicted would do better, but it seems in team events he's unimpeachable. He still struggles in singles, losing to Karlovic, the oldest man in the draw in the first round. Not necessarily true. He was coming back from injury. Mm. He had good results in singles in lesser tournaments, and then he kind of built off of that with the ATP Cup and the Davis Cup and what have you. So maybe that's a bit unfair to him. You're right. I just expected a little more. I want to go back real quickly and talk about the fact that after Venus lost in the first round, we got word that she was then entering the mixed doubles draw and playing with Cabal. And they played their first round match last night and lost, which is not great. Right. And a super tie break, right? They had won the first set. They were up a set and a break, and then it just all fell apart. Mm -hmm. Cabal is the number one in men's doubles. His partner, Robert Farah, is suspended for testing positive for a banned substance, as we talked about last episode. His frequent mixed doubles partner, Abigail Spears, is also on a suspension for a banned substance. Cabal is uh, is having a rough go of it lately. One of the other big stories from the first week was Caroline Wozniacki's impending retirement and when that would happen. We were on Kara Watch from the very first match that she played. The one that everybody expected her to lose was in the second round against Diana Yastremska. And to Caroline's immense credit, she came back from a double break deficit in both sets to win (laughs) 7-5-7-5. And it was a delicious win because Yastremska was back on that bullshit. Wow. Like, it is very unusual that you see tennis Twitter unite on a position and this was the most popular opinion I've, I think I've ever seen. They do not like Yastrzemska's medical timeouts and what's perceived as gamesmanship. And from now on, if she takes an MTO ever, it's going to be seen as poor sportsmanship because she has a record. She takes M- MTOs constantly. We preach all the time that it's in poor taste and unseemly to be questioning folks' medical timeouts. But when they happen in this volume, (laughs) then surely questions need to be asked. And not just in the volume, but the timing that is always aligned with this volume. It's it's (laughs) it's it's kind of it's crazy. And then Mm. your point about looking at this going forward, the magnifying glass was placed on this even bigger because Sasha Bain, her new coach, weighed in. On the situation. Yeah. yeah. He's like, well, let me set this record straight. How dare y'all question the integrity of this situation? Said that she had been struggling with the leg for days. You don't know. You don't know our life. And of course, Tennis Twitter comes with the dossier. They've got files upon files. And they're like, oh, what about this? In 2018. (laughs) The ratio on that tweet was something to behold. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson... For Sasha is, dude, chill. Like, chill. He needs to stay out of it and act professional. Comment less. And then folks As we say from a podcast on which we comment a lot. And then we hear from folks who are pointing out that after Mladenovic and Bayin split, and then Bayin went with Yastremsko, they go and look through her likes on Twitter, and they find... That Miss Yastremska has liked a tweet that confirms Dominic Team and Kiki Madenovich have broken up. <laughs> I spent some time in Donna Vekic's likes the other day, which was delightful because she liked a tweet criticizing Yastremska's medical time. <laughs> She's just living her best life these days. But back to Caroline, 
I wanted to expand on Caroline on the podcast because we didn't tweet a whole lot about it, but this is a momentous career. Wozniacki's retirement is something that needs to be talked about and needs to be commemorated because she she did great things. In many ways, she helped to define the past, say, 12 years in women's tennis. She spent 71 weeks at number one at the time without a Grand Slam. She was part of that conversation criticizing women's tennis for having these slamness number ones. But to remain number one without winning a slam is fairly impressive because you have to gather a lot of points to do that. We also see folks decry the top of women's tennis where you're not seeing any one or two people dominate or stay in the top two for an extended period of time. And that's something that's part of her legacy that she was able to do. Mm -hmm. She ran the New York City Marathon in a an impressive time. To me, what I will remember from Caroline is that period where it looked like she was done, right? In, what was it? Like 2016, 2017, she was really struggling. Her ranking dropped down to the 80s and it looked like she's probably going to retire soon. And we even talked about it privately. Like she doesn't seem like she's really in it. And At the end of 2017, she had flipped her career around to the point of winning the Australian Open in January 2018, fighting through that match against Yana Fett, fighting through matches she probably should have lost. And that's that's kind of what I take from Wozniacki's career, is battling and overcoming these little shortcomings in her game. It it says a lot about her character on court. She eventually lost to Ons Jabeur who herself is having a breakout moment, the first Arab woman to make the round of 16 at a slam in history. Somebody with a varied game, lots of options, designed to drive people crazy on Mm -hmm. the tennis court. Because you see it so infrequently now. Goes out to Ons in three sets, and in the on-court interview afterward, is able to make a self-aware joke about herself while fighting back tears, Mm. saying that it's fitting I ended my career in a long three-set battle and that it ended on a forehand error. Like, these are things that I've struggled (laughs) with my entire career. But so ungenerous to herself because she did have such a great career. And Shanda Rubin, to her credit, was like, girl, don't do that. Like, (laughs) don't be down on yourself right now. The other thing I think about with Caroline Wozniacki is her ability to make improvements to her game, to add muscle to her game. When folks said that she doesn't have the weapons, she comes back with a beefed up serve. She comes back with more power on her ground strokes. She did the work. Caroline Wozniacki could never be accused of cutting corners on a tennis court. Because Mm -hmm. while you may look at her game and think it deficient when compared to a lot of the more powerful players on tour, and also deficient in comparison to some of the more creative players on tour. She was kind of in the middle between those two extremes. She was still able to make the most of what she had. Mm -hmm. You never felt like she was overwhelmed on court, regardless of who she was playing. You know, she had a self-belief, she had a determination, she had a drive, she had a work ethic that is admirable. Like all of us, Caroline contains multitudes. She was dogged when she had an opinion about a a ruling by an umpire, she was, I would say, litigious. I do believe we've called her attorney at law several times. (laughs) I I think it was Caroline Wozniacki Esquire. (laughs) uh, There was an entertainment factor to that that will be missed. I think I saw a caffeinated Cree tweet that she's going to miss complaining about Wozniacki complaining. (laughs) So who knows what's next for Caroline, but... We're going to be doing this a lot, I think, this year, memorializing players' careers. But it is super important to pause and recognize Caroline's achievements. She seems super happy moving on to this next phase of her life. Her family seems to be a close-knit family. They were all there, mom, dad, brother. They all came on court after the on-court interview. Her dad picked her up and carried her a few feet in Mm. the air and then shared a hug with her mom. And when her brother came over, he just buried his head in her shoulder and just started crying. It was, it was, it was touching. You mentioned Jabour. She has put together her best run on a major, reaching the fourth round. 
She knocked out number 12, Joanna Conta, in the first round, then Garcia, then Wozniacki. And in that slot that was supposed to be the BFF Bowl, that was going to be Serena Wozniacki or Serena Yastremska, we have Wang Chong and Ons Jabour, which presents an incredible opportunity for either player. And really, Jabour, I think, finds herself in a winnable position again. Definitely a winnable match for Ons Jabour. Uh, playing Wang Chung. I think this is a good place to bring up the reason why Wang Chung is in the second week of a Grand Slam, and that's because she beat, unexpectedly, Serena Williams. Right. This on the WTA day that will live in infamy, Friday, down under, we saw Caroline Wozniacki retire, number three Naomi Osaka lose to Coco Goff, and Serena Williams lose to Wang Chung, who she pounded at the u.s open it was a freaky friday a freaky friday because a lot of these were the inverse of the u.s open oh i see what you did you see what i did yeah okay very clever so who was Lindsay lohan it's not that deep (laughs) but like you mentioned serena had just blitzed wang chung in in flushing in 44 minutes i think she won 15 points and we were one of those who wanted you to know at the time That this was in no way representative of Wang's talent. Right. That she was much better than what she showed that day. And boy, did she ever show us and prove that in this match. Really, from the jump. She was very strong on her own serve. The defense was exceptional because balls were coming back deep and with angles. She was just very steady. Serena's level, I mean, you could see, Serena's level was very low. It looked like her energy level was low. Throughout the first set, I was surprised not to see or hear her doing these screaming pump-up things that she does. So that sometimes border on hindrance, right? That she was doing in her second round match. She just seemed not 100% emotionally engaged for much of the, the first part of that match. The two things that I noticed about Serena watching that match, I have scarcely seen a tennis player swing so hard from the baseline with results that do not match the effort. Mm -hmm. I I said to you at one point, she's going to strain a pec muscle. Right. Because she was swinging so hard, but yet unable to push Wang Chung back off the baseline. And the other thing that I noticed was her, to be frank, terrible footwork. So many times... And at so many important junctures of that match, Serena was found lunging after the ball. And it wasn't because she's slow, or she, I mean, she's clearly fit enough. Something was not right to then allow her to move effortlessly in this match. Right. Like you said, the fitness is there, but she's not going to be as fast as she was in 2013, say. It's, it's not going to happen. Like, she's missing a step, and that's fine. Because of her age and what she's been through physically, totally understandable. But her court positioning was confusing. Her footwork didn't allow her to get in position to hit balls, especially at the net. And the strategy seemed to be control down the middle of the court. Mm. And I, I can get it on some level because when she hit angles, often she would set up Wong to hit these incredible down the line or cross court winners. If she pulled her way off out of the court, uh, maybe she was afraid of that happening. But Serena was just like pounding it down the middle. See, that's not what it was. What I think it was, Serena was banking on US Open 2.0. And that even if US Open 2.0 didn't happen, it would be US Open 1.5. Like she could (laughs) deploy the same strategy and be able to bully Wang Chung and overpower her from the middle of the court and eventually would work. And what we saw was that not only did it not work, it didn't even come close to working because Wang Chung had made adjustments in her game. She was asked after the match, yo, you lose this badly in New York, what are the things that you did differently? Or this might have been after the US Open match where they asked her, well, where do you go from here? And she said, I have to get stronger. I have to go do more work in the Mm. gym. I have to do all these things. That became clear to her then, and she went and did it. This was not the pushover (laughs) 
right. the, the, the fragile player physically on court that we saw in, in New York. This was somebody who was much stronger, able to absorb Serena's power. And when Serena saw that that wasn't working, her reaction was to hit even harder. And when her body's that tense and not able to be fluid on the tennis court, you're not going to get the timing. You're not going to generate the pace. You're just going to be looking like a hot mess out there. So Serena was down 4-2 and 5-3 in the second set. It was very close to being over. She intermittently conjured some magic yes. in that second set. Really great stuff. A lot of that magic, if you recall, came from Wang making the wrong choice. Okay. Like having an open court and then hitting the ball back to Serena. That is part of... It wasn't of, all like that. It wasn't all, but that's part of the magic of a comeback, right? And you think that, okay, fine, Serena's gotten a bit of good luck in these moments. This is where it's tailor-made for her to not run away with a third set, but build enough momentum to then right the ship, course correct, and come good by the end of the match. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen. Right. So she did kind of run away with the tiebreak in the second set. And I expected a very different third set than what we saw. Because Wong's game did not falter at all. She didn't falter mentally. And that was that was too much. That was all she wrote for Serena. Because Serena's level was very low. And there just was not enough buckling from Wong to, to give her an opening in that third set. See, I don't think Serena's level was that bad. We've seen Serena play worse. Yeah. I oh, think yeah. what's at play here is that Wang Chang did not blink at all. There was no give. Well, that's it what was, I said. No, I'm, I understand. <laughs> it was a near flawless performance. It was fearless and near flawless. I just wanted to reiterate and mm -hmm. emphasize right. what you said. But also push back against your assertion that Serena didn't play great, that she played poorly. I think that's probably she what hit saying. like what fifty seven, fifty eight errors. Which generally I'm not really concerned about errors, especially with a big hitter like Serena and Venus. I don't really pay attention to those stats. But Serena's self assessment. Now we can talk about that. But against most opponents, this is what I'm trying to get at here. Against most opponents, it would have been enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, against but against a top ten player, she would have been gone in two sets easily. Not necessarily. I I disagree. Against Bianca, she'd be gone in, uh, with what the loss of a few games per set. She may have played differently against a Bianca sure. in the third round of a slam. <laughs> like this is all conjecture. Okay. So Serena was not exactly generous to Wong in her press conference. It was surprising because I did kind of expect late stage Serena to be. A more complimentary because she has been generally she was pissed it felt that she played unprofessionally she said that she's too old to be playing this poorly <laughs> and that it was entirely unprofessional she was asked what do you think that wang chung did well and she goes like i guess uh i i, I guess she hit a couple balls well but like really if we're being honest with ourselves this is all on me i played so poorly <laughs> mm -hmm. now I get it. Like, I get why people are sort of annoyed by that, but the hand-wringing is misplaced. This was Serena for 75% of her career. She was known for not being very gracious to her opponents in defeat. It's only since really this, what, third era of Serena's career, like from 2013 on, where she became more magnanimous. That's who a lot of people know now. But if you've been following Serena for 20-something years, you know that this is an element of her personality that may not be pretty, but it's always been there. It's also an element of her personality that some may argue is necessary for her to be who she is. Right. Other folks might say, well, it's not necessary for Rafa Nadal, and it's not necessary for Novak Djokovic. No, but it was necessary for Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe and Yvonne Lendl. And it's what, like, yeah. this is a different era of men's tennis, but there have been personalities that have bristled throughout the history of the sport and there will continue to be mm -hmm. my point is i don't think you can make blanket comparisons between people at such a high elite level of professional sport because everybody's wired differently and it takes different motivations to get people where they need to be to be fair i don't i don't love that from serena but you can tell that she is motivated and she expected a lot more from herself i as a fan i would prefer that to oh my god, she just played so amazing, I couldn't do anything. 
because that's hollow to me. If I'm an outside observer, I can see. I can understand the criticism. How I read it is Serena was embarrassed that this happened to her in a third round after, quite frankly, having stellar results on the Grand Slam circuit since she's come back from having Olympia. Right. Notwithstanding the last to Sonia Kenyon at the French Open and then having to withdraw or retire from, what, the third round in her first French Open. Right? The French hasn't been mm-hmm. great to her, but, but she's had... She had no preparation for Roland Garros against Kenan. Like, it wasn't that shocking. My point is, French Open aside, the other slams have been not that difficult for her. Mm-hmm. She's been able to bring her best up until the final. And this was not the case at right. this tournament. And this was after she had already won in Auckland to start the year. We thought, perhaps she thought as well, that she had checked a box on something that she needed to do to take that next step. And what I thought in this match was another box that could have been checked, that would have been integral to really having her fully come back at the Grand Slam level, was to be seriously tested by a top opponent. And by top, I mean somebody playing at the top of their game, not flinching, being able to troubleshoot within that match, come back and win in three, like we saw Serena do pretty much all throughout, what was it, 2014, 2015, where she'd be playing all these three-set matches at slams but still winning. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was something, if she was able to do that, that would have been maybe the last thing she needed to get over the hump. Well, that's the story of her career, really. You and I disagreed a lot about this this week because you sort of erred on the side of complimenting Wong's performance. And I want to strike a balance when we talk about these things now Because we've established our high opinion of women's tennis and women athletes. But at some point, it can come off as patronizing when you sort of over-compliment players who beat top players. Because sometimes, those players are simply being professional and playing their game, and they win. They come up against a player who maybe isn't on her best day. So I want to sort of find that middle ground. Do you know what I mean? I think multiple things can be true. (laughs) And uh, in this instance, Serena can be mad as hell at herself, embarrassed as hell for herself, and still say five words that are complimentary about Wang and then lay into herself as much as she wants. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on because Serena is out. What else has been going on in the first week? Some mini stories. Maria Sharapova gets a wild card. Roundly beaten by number 19, Donna Vekic. No surprise there. Maria Sharapova is now well into the 300s in her ranking. And the road forward, save for a slew of wild cards and good performances, is not looking bright. We talked about Team Canada earlier, but I should say that Gabby Dabrowski is alive in women's doubles. She is the number six team alongside Yelena Ostapenko. We have a new entrant inductee into the Body Serve Hall of Shame, and this is Matteo Bertini. I've already forgotten his name. Oh, you're on board with this one? You weren't on board with the last one, but no. because... The, Joe Wilfried Songa, he has put in the years. It wasn't fair to target him like you did, because you know that I love him. That is one way to read it inaccurately. <laughs> the other way to read it is that you are biased and blindsided and now yes also you can true. see the errors of your ways now that Matteo Bertini and his fuckery has put that into full relief I'm just saying if you gave Joe a sentence of what four or five months Matteo gets at least triple quadruple that he mm-hmm. loses to Tennis Sangren Matteo was the number eight seed and look what Matteo hath wrought Tennis Sangren is now in the round of 16 and will play Fabio Fognini. And really, a a zero-sum game. A lose-lose situation here. Tennis Sangren, who is just wanting to know how long do I need to be persecuted before people just get over it. Before they realize that my politics is just a hobby. That I'm really, first and foremost, a tennis player. And when are y'all just going to let it go? I can't allow myself to be worked up to the extent that is warranted for this because the bandwidth just will not allow it. It's very, very 2018. 
But the fact remains that Matteo Berrettini caused this to happen. And Tennis Sagarin is now the last standing American man in the Australian Open draw. Mm. Again, like he was in 2018. I know. And for a while, after 2018 happened, I was like, well, let's just wait a year. The points will drop off. We won't have to deal with this anymore. He won Auckland. He gets challenger results that are that are good every now and then. He has a fourth round at Wimbledon last year. He does these things sporadically throughout the year to keep him relevant in the rankings to the point where we have to see him again. And uh, that is just where we're at. It's something that I have to accept. Perhaps you have to accept at this point. He is good enough to be an ATP top 100 player. Yes. It is just what it is. To be relevant. So what is the sentence that we're meeting out to Mr. Berrettini here? Oh, I would say four to five years is appropriate. Now, how dare you put me in the position of telling you that you're being draconian in this situation? Okay. I, I, prison, prison reform. I levy a six-month, never-to-be-commuted sentence against Matteo Berrettini. Okay. Uh, I'll accept it. What shall we refer to him as going forward? At the end of Joe's sentence, it was the 34-year-old Frenchman. Um, I don't know. The Roman? Isla Tomlanovich's lesser half? The, what is it? The fianzata? Fidanzato. <laughs> They're not engaged, by the way. We'll get to that. One of the American good dudes, Francis Tiafo, had the misfortune of drawing number four Daniel Medvedev in the first round. It wasn't a shock that Francis went out. He did win a set. They played good tennis. It was a good battle. The result went as expected, but unfortunately for Francis, his ranking has now plummeted because he was unable to defend his quarterfinal points right. from a year ago. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the 34-year-old Frenchman, Joe Wilfried Songa. Yeah, some bad injury news from Joe Songa. He retired in his first round match against Popurin, who is an Australian, and told the press in French that he has some, what is it, calcification of ligaments in his back? that may be irreversible, but may sort of work itself out. We, we're not sure. The exact quote from Conte Monet in Le Keep is, I have ligaments that have calcified in my back. It's more or less irreversible. We can just calm the inflammation by doing an injection. In time, maybe it will settle and I will not hurt anymore, but there is no certainty. So this, coupled with his sickle cell diagnosis as well, does not bode well for Joe in the twilight of his career. Hmm. It's upsetting. Speaking of upsets, there were a lot of them, more so on the women's side, right? but a lot of them in the first week. But the top 10 seeds on the women's side all made it to the third round, and then... And then six of them were then like... And all hell broke loose. <laughs> six of them were like, I'm good. Early on, though, Arena Sabalenka, the number 11, lost to Carla Suarez Navarro, who's playing her final Australian Open. We already talked about Joanna Conta losing to Jabour. She was the number 12 seed. A, a stunner was number 21, Anisimova, going out to Zarina Diaz in the first round. Then we get a little further into the tournament in the third round, and Garbine Muguruza just thumps Alina Svitolina. 6162. Nobody doubts Muguruza's skill and uh, experience, but this was a surprising score line to me. She seems to be back. She seems to be playing confidently. She's got Conchita Martinez in her camp. If you recall, she won Wimbledon while Conchita was doing part time duty with Sam Sumik mm -hmm. in 2017. The thing that we heard a lot throughout these three matches was Garbinia's off-season trek up Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. And if you watched that third-round match against Alina Svitolina, you may have noted that the commentators caught on, because it quite literally was all we could hear about. <laughs> that Garbinia Muguruza needed to clear her head after the toxic relationship with Sam Sumik. She went up to the mountain... Because we asked her to. <laughs> oh, Over the clouds, where the skies are blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's found this renewed rigor and vigor 
and focus in her tennis. <laughs> I'm telling you, if she wins this tournament, if she wins a couple more matches, you will never want to hear Mount Kilimanjaro ever again. Other upsets, Maria Sakari takes out Madison Keys. Very surprising. Yes. Madison Keys, Brisbane finalist, looked in great form, and it just wasn't there for her against a, a game-focused, self-believing Maria Sakari. She even says that she believes she can go all the way and win this tournament, which good for her. How about number six, Belinda Bencic, falling meekly to Annette Contivate in the third round? Six love, six one. It was a question whether she would win a game in that match. It wasn't just falling meekly. It was being completely blitzed off the court. Yes. This was this was a flawless victory from Annette Contivite. It was the manifestation of all the the talent that we've heard that she's had over the years and unable to really bring it to the Grand Slam form. Mm. And kudos to her because Bencic is an accomplished player, a complete player, and she had no answers. It wasn't that she played poorly. Kanzavit just was on. Karolina Pliskova, the number two seed, winner in Brisbane, loses to Anastasia Pavlyuchenkova, who is now with Sam Sumik. Pavlyuchenkova reached the quarterfinals here last year. She's reached the second week of slams many times. We know that she has incredible talent. Her ground strokes are pristine when they're on. I see a lot of Kim Kleisters in her ground strokes, personally. The fluidity with which she hits the back end, it's it's something to behold. She is just a really likable player. She is extremely well-spoken in English. I think she assesses herself very well in interviews. And I was impressed because there were many times where the match could have gone the other way. When Nastia made decisions that weren't necessarily great... Uh, double faults. A flurry of double faults where she could have fallen apart or had even a slight lapse in concentration. And she managed to just push by it each time. This was a two-set match that lasted two and a half hours. The <laughs> right. first set lasted well over 75 minutes. And there was a... <laughs> Carolina's first service game, I think, was, what, 18 minutes long? <laughs> this doesn't normally happen for someone like Carolina, who serves as well as she does. She wasn't serving well for a lot of that first set. But this, of course, brings up questions about Carolina and her capacity to win a slam. She is technically so sound. She seems mentally unflappable in smaller tournaments. But, like, this exposed the lack of another gear for her. There, there wasn't really a lot of problem solving. Yes, a lack of another gear. But that's in relation to a lot of these other players... Not really playing their best on like the regular WTA tour and then able to find something extra or train toward mm. deploying something extra in these moments. Mm. The the inability at this point since her breakthrough at the 2016 US Open making that final losing to Kerber, the inability to translate that into more consistent, deep Grand Slam results across all surfaces is strange. Yeah, It's something yeah. that is hard to explain outside of a lack of versatility in her game. It's not enough to say that she doesn't move well because she's moved better. She's moving better than she ever has. She's worked on a lot of things in her game. She has a great serve. But folks are able to figure her out in these high-pressure, high-stakes environments in Grand Slams. And uh, I don't know where she goes from here. On that night that Serena and Naomi lost... Roger Federer was very close to following them out of the tournament, and I was not relishing the media narrative that was going to spring up around these two goats losing on the same day. Roger Federer lost to John Millman at the 2018 U.S. Open. We were expecting a competitive match, and we got it. The atmosphere around Millman was electric, but, uh, you know, a lot of the crowd, most of the crowd, was still pulling for Roger. Gets to a fifth set, Millman is exposing, I think, a bit of rustiness in Roger's game. He made a ton of forehand errors. And we get to a match tiebreak. Millman is leading 8-4, looks to be over. And Roger is able to conjure some magic, win six straight points, and win the match 10-8 in this super tiebreak. With the aid of a couple errors from John Millman. Yeah. We should not 
understate the achievement of John Melman in the situation. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to catch lightning in a bottle once, but then to work on your game, to bring it again on your home soil with the expectation right away. He won that first set from Federer, breaking early. Federer broke back and he thought, well, perhaps this isn't the fairy tale that it could be. And Millman broke right back to take the first set, mm. pushes it to five sets, and gave, but for a few tough moments in that fifth set, an incredible account of himself. And you watch him play somebody like Federer, and indeed you watch him play the first two rounds. His entire Australian Open account, you watch him play, and you think, how is this guy not ranked so much higher? Because he's got so many tools. Mm. Other upsets on the men's side, we talked about Bertini losing to Sangren. We talked about Oje Eliassim. Tommy Paul, he took out Grigor Dimitrov. You got nothing to say? <laughs> no. R.I.P. Grigor's lovely kit. I was not one of those folks who hated the pajama jumpsuit <laughs> haute couture. I don't know if you, I loved it together. You keep saying the that. The jacket is amazing. You keep saying that, but it, mm. that was the design. That's what it was meant to be, and I buy it. I like, do, you walk yeah. out in pajamas, and you wear something else. There's nothing wrong with that. I do love Grigor's boldness. We told you that Raonic beat Tsitsipas. That was another, I would say, huge upset. Yes. The number six seed, he was somebody defending semifinal points from last year, entirely capable of beating any of the top guys right. on the ATP Tour. And Fucevic, who beat Shapovalov, has put together an excellent run here, beating Sinner in the next round, then knocking out Tommy Paul, and has given himself the opportunity to play Roger Federer in the round of 16. Other surprises in this first week? On the women's side, Cece Bellis. She is back. She's still only 20 years old, which is hard to believe. She had been misdiagnosed. She's been through a lot of surgeries. She was told by doctors that she would likely never play tennis again. And here she is, beating Karolina Mokova in the second round. On the men's side, Ernest Gulbis, you mentioned that earlier in the show. He uh, is back inside the top 200 on the strength of a run through qualifying and a third round appearance, eventually losing to Gal Mofis in straight sets. <laughs> but Ernie's run reminded me just how many people love this guy. And it's still, to this day, something that's totally perplexing to me. And I actually went through a lot of these comments trying to, to understand why. And it seems, tragically, that it can be distilled down to curls and reading books. <laughs> like, Ernest Gulbis is known as a tennis hipster, somebody who reads... A lot. Reads deep stuff. He's reading Dostoevsky. He's reading all these important old authors, you know? And uh, people like it. Well, uh, I mean, that is actually pretty unusual in tennis. I hear you. A counter-argument <laughs> that a man reading books is a huge selling point it is, is a pretty low bar. It is indeed but it is irresistible to some. I mean, I do I do understand the appeal. I don't necessarily share it, but I do get it. He is also somebody, if we're being 100% full disclosure here, who's had some problematic things said in the past, saying that he wouldn't want his sisters playing tennis because it's no place for them to be, that it would hinder child rearing. Oh. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. <laughs> Which you're, is such, just, you're such a downer. I am. I'm being an asshole to all of you who really are enjoying this moment. And to that I say, I'm glad you had that moment. Enjoy it. I wish him well. I don't think that stuff that he said necessarily at 22, 23 is what he thinks now. Maybe it's not. There have also been far worse male players on the ATP tour. You know, I think a lot of his perspectives come from... His privilege, like this is a dude who Yeah, would I mean, take, he's like a billionaire. This dude would take his daddy's Learjet to tournaments, like to a Challenger tournament. <laughs> and so like... Why not? His, per, his perspective on the men's tour is a little bit different. So like when I see stuff about him now, 
And it's like, well, wow, I've grown, I've matured, I have such a different perspective. I'm so much more emotional now. Yes. And I can relate to that as I'm now a little bit older than he is. But also he's had a lot more mistakes afforded him and a lot more opportunities afforded him than most people in his position. So like I, I find it hard to... To warm up to him? To warm up and to get there. You know, maybe, mm. maybe this is part of my 36th year that this is on the horizon for me. I will be a Gulbistan <laughs> by the end of the year. Alexander Zverev has very quietly reached the round of 16 here, which I think has been perfect for him. He's under the radar because of what happened at ATP Cup, those three losses. The expectations were relatively low compared to how they've been in the past. But he spoke to a German press about trying to take something off of his first serve in his first few matches just to get a rhythm again, just to get serves in. And it appears to have worked quite well. He's beaten Chekinato, Gerasimov, and Verdasco all in straight sets. Verdasco was a pretty surprising one for me, how easy that was. In the first few matches, he's hit very few double faults. Four in the first, zero double faults in his second match. And his first serve percentage has been in the 70s or higher through all of those matches. Obviously, a complete turnaround based on what we were expecting based on uh, ATP Cup. But this has to be an ideal first week for him because there was very little attention on him. He's also somebody who often struggles in the first few rounds of majors, a la Kane Shikori, ends up playing unnecessary yeah. four or five set matches, and he's now found himself in the fourth round having not lost a set. Now, he will face a much higher caliber of player in Andre Rublev, who has gained so much confidence over this, what, 15-match win streak, if you include Davis Cup. Andre is just mentally in a really good place. I think he has, especially against Goffin, has been able to stay the course when he was being completely outplayed. So we're looking at the men's fourth round matchups now. You, I think that's where you've led us. Rublev Zverev plays on the top half. At the very top of the draw, Nadal plays Kyrgios in the fourth round. That's going to be wild. Wild in that it's going to be a wild atmosphere. Mm. Kyrgios prevailed through a, what, four-and-a-half-hour match against Karen Hachanov in the third round in just an incredible atmosphere. On Melbourne Arena, he's played all his matches on Melbourne Arena. He loves the intimacy of that. That will not be the case in the fourth round. That's absolutely going to be on Rod Laver Arena. Kyrgios did not look good physically in that match, called for a medical timeout before the first set was over, seemed to be favoring a hamstring, mm. saying that he had a sharp pain in his hamstring, was still able to go up two sets to love, was up two sets to love in a break before getting a little bit careless in that third set. And uh, Hachanov finally started to play some of the tennis that we're accustomed to seeing from him at his best, eventually Nick pulling it out in the fifth set super tiebreaker. Nadal has looked excellent in the first week, especially against Pablo Carreño Busta. It was not a very exciting match. It went pretty quickly. The winner of Nadal Kyrgios will play the winner of Mofis and Dominic Team in the quarterfinals. Dominic Team has had some troubles in the early rounds, is is seemingly playing himself into better form now, and Gal Mofis shot back at the folks who were reporting that he had injured himself playing PlayStation. <laughs> I actually made a last minute decision yeah. to have him lose in my racket bracket because I read that. I'm like, well, I know stuff is wild concerning Mofis all the time, but this is like this is next level. So that video game in injury was uh, overstated? He said it's fake. Okay. <laughs> to Med round off the top half, Medvedev will play Vavrinka. I am salivating about that one. Vavrinka goes through after John Isner has to retire. Only from the Australian Open, not from tennis in general. And then you mentioned Andrei Rublev playing Alexander Zverev. Nice, cute matchups there, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think that Ruby Zverev match could be great. On the bottom half... Less fun. <laughs> There's a, I would say there is one matchup that I'm looking forward to, which is Raunish Chilich. Because Chilich, as an unseeded player right now, has gotten himself to the round of 16. Raunich knocking out Tsitsipas is on a roll. I actually would like to see that. But we also have Sangren Fognini. Enough said about that. Fucevic Federer. 
And at the bottom there, Diego Schwartzman versus Novak Djokovic. I'm actually rooting for Raonic and Cilic to both have a deep run in this tournament. Deeper run, I should say, mm. because they've both been through it. And Cilic has been struggling mightily in the last 18 months. Is there any scenario where Novak doesn't win the Australian Open? I say it now and I could be made a fool throughout the week. Who knows? But it is looking very, very good for an eighth title for him. He's been in great form. Yeah, I honestly, the only thing that I see stopping him getting from the final is, this may sound stupid, but Schwartzman or, or Raonic or Cilic. Mm. I think one of those three could do something against him. Do you have any predictions to say what's going to happen here? Um, I'm kind of superstitious about predictions now. I think, you know, Stanley relishes beating up on these younger guys. But I think Medvedev probably gets through that. But I think that we could see a Ruby semifinal. I'm just saying. Ruby against? I don't know. Probably Nadal. I think the Kyrgios match will be exciting, but I don't know that Nick will be physically and tactically up to it. We've heard a lot about the state of the, the surface in Australia, that it's gritty, that it's much slower than in years past. The balls are fluffing up we, very early. We need to put to rest, though, this idea that Nadal likes slow courts. What? Why is John Wertheim is going on TV saying these conditions suit Nadal? Why would you think that? This is not a clay court. I don't know how many times he has to explain this like, in press. But Nadal likes fast, high-bouncing surfaces. So if a surface is slow and it's not bouncing high, that does not suit him. No. The reason why he plays well at Roland Garros in hot conditions is because he's able to generate more revolutions on the ball, hit through the ball, and heavy conditions in gloomy outdoor clay situations are just as bad for him. It's all about... If you were to pick an optimal situation for Nadal, it's outdoors, it's hot, the ball is bouncing high, and the surface is fast. That's also well, maybe... Clay, clay is not fast, but on a hard court, he doesn't want a, one of these sticky, slow-ass hard courts. Yes, but that may also explain why he hasn't been able to win an Australian Open since 2009. In part, because the semifinals and the finals are played at night. Mm. Just putting that out there. But my, my point in all of this is that this is this should not be news to folks at this point. Right. On the women's side, we have Ash Barty, the number one seed, alive, and she'll play number 18, Risk. Maria Sakari, number 22, facing Petra Kvitova, who again has quietly made her way through the draw with very few hiccups. Coco Goff and number 14, Sonia Kennan. And Ons Jabour and number 27, Wang Chang. I think the best case scenario for this tournament would be to have Ash Barty win. What better scenario than to have her in this very, uh, what should I say, precarious time with the natural disaster, with the bushfires, and her being one of the faces of it, being the number one seed, being her, being so beloved, being the face of the tournament, to be able to do it. And there aren't that many players of her caliber left in her way. There's right, Petra Kvitova potentially in the semifinals. And then on the bottom, there's Simona Halep still there. And then there's Muguruza who is back. And Kerber, who is resurgent. Of, you know, a former champion here, Kerber. But six of the top ten seeds are already gone. Right. But Barty herself has rejected that whole sentimentality thing about an Australian winning. She said, nobody cares. Basically, nobody cares if an Australian wins here. She cares about how people in her country are doing about like more important things than tennis, which I really, I liked pushing back at that whole like New Orleans Saints winning the Super Bowl thing. Do you know what I mean? Like that sort of triumph in disaster because athletes are in a privileged position. Yes, I'm saying mm -hmm. for the tournament. I didn't say for the Australian oh, okay. people. Okay. On the bottom half there, we have Annette Contivate facing Iga Sviantek. Let's pause for a moment and talk about mm -hmm. Sviantek. <laughs> Learn how to say her name because you're going to need to know. She did a, a little tutorial for you on the WTA uh, Twitter. And listen, Polish is really hard. And if you're a native English speaker, it is incumbent upon us to at least attempt, at least give a, a good college try to say somebody's name right. We may miss, but we can try. 
And when you say us, you mean folks who take it upon themselves to have the pulpit of a podcast that covers tennis. Yes. People who are <laughs> people who are covering tennis on television. If you are in the business of calling tennis players names, if you are being paid to do so, if you are being crowdfunded to do so, then it is incumbent on you to make make an effort to pronounce names properly and my god it's not be facetious and flippant about it it's just a matter of respect like we we may not get it right 100 percent of the time but we're trying at least yeah it is not pretentious to have a player want her name pronounced correctly if you didn't get the clues i'm not trying to be shady but this is uh, a critique of a, a segment that appeared on the tennis podcast recently that I have to take issue with because Shiantek wanting her name pronounced correctly is not uh, objectionable. It is, uh, it's not pretentious. We, we can at least, uh, make a, make an attempt. I have no intention of trying to colonize this woman's name. Her tutorial was also not obtuse. I thought it, it was, was, I thought it was very clear yeah. and it becomes a matter of making an earnest effort to be in the vicinity. Yeah. The conversation is very weird to me. You don't have to be right. I'm sure we're still not doing it right as we sit here on our pulpit. But <laughs> no, but at least attempt to be in the but vicinity. But the difference is that we're not steadfastly pronouncing it wrong on purpose. That's the difference. Sorry. So the other so, so, the so, other so, round of 16. <laughs> Simona Halep number 4 versus number 16 at least Mertens. Halep uh I mean Halep could win this thing too. Like, the bottom half is so wild to me. Really, the rest of the women's draw in general is is a huge, huge question mark. And honestly, I know that we sometimes find, find ourselves in these situations where it's, oh my god, anybody but that person. And I don't think we have anybody here who fits that bill. There are a lot of people who've paid their dues, a lot of people with immense talent, and I, I'd, be, I'd be okay with anybody winning. Muguruza versus number nine, Burtons. Muguruza is unseated, but like we and a lot of people have identified her as somebody who could win this thing. And if she did, it wouldn't be uh, shocking or or embarrassing or whatever because of her incredible talent. Shall we move on to the press shit show? Yes, there have been there have been some winners this week. One of my faves. I have developed a real um, affinity for Isla Tomlanovich this week. Because of how she's played, and also how she has maneuvered through through being a public figure. She is well-liked in Italy now because she is the Roman's girlfriend. She's covered a lot more than she would be normally. Sorry, I, the, we're going to have to fix that because the Roman doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, she is dating Matteo. And, no, he's been banned. Oh, right. But you know, this is why a lot of Italian journalists know her. And she'll pop up in, in Italian newspapers and stuff. But she was asked by Ubaldo. Uh, well, not even asked. It was like the preface to a question. This may be the second time you're playing a slam as a fiancé to a player. And she says, fiancé? What kind of word is that? I think fidanzata is the Italian word. But in English it means fiancé and I'm not his fiancé. He then says, how should I call you girlfriend? And she says, I guess Isla would be great too. Our, you know what? And that's that on that but again we find ourselves having to deal with these situations at ubaldo's doing and i will quote the great latrice royale and say the level of unprofessionalism is far too much i thought you were gonna say good god girl get a grip (laughs) so many are applicable (laughs) journalists this week are determined to fan the flames to this nadal and curios feud that doesn't really exist. If it does exist, it is completely one-sided because Nick likes to poke and jab and he likes to mock Rafa's idiosyncrasies, his tics on court. And uh, it's just, it's not cute. Like, I think we've established that we don't mind a little mess, but when mess is completely mean-spirited, it's it's not that funny. I just don't like it. Also, I just don't, And unprovoked. I don't understand how it becomes the immediate go-to so quickly in high-stakes pressure situations like it did in that match. Right. 
like without thinking, he's mocking Nadal, doing that, the hair behind the ears and then picking the butt. Be, I, I just don't know because he was called for a time violation. No, I understand. Yeah, I get that. No, I mean I'm not telling you. I'm I'm agreeing that that's ridiculous. And then Simon does the same thing. Simon doesn't need any help to be an asshole. Like he doesn't need any encouragement. And then the umpire was laughing. I don't know. I don't know who made a joke for you to laugh at as the umpire. I don't know what's funny. Amanda Nisimova, in her press conference after she was just upset in this tournament, was asked about her father. And then she had to leave the press room in tears. This was bad because the question was asked and then it was pushed. There was a follow up. And that's what really set her off. And apparently the journalist who asked it was extremely apologetic and embarrassed, as she should be. But it was just a just a bizarre situation. These are not politicians. These are tennis players. Somebody asked Rafa yesterday, quote, do you like Nick? Do you get on with him? Guys, you gotta be, you have got to be kidding me. You gotta do better than this. What, <laughs> what, what could I even say to that? I can't even be bothered by this because I find it so uninteresting at this point. The Nick Rafa dynamic is not interesting. No. This might be a good time for our dramatic reading. Mm -hmm. This one was actually kind of delightful. This isn't a, a failure on the job. This is a funny conversation. Ben Rothenberg did a good job of asking Serena Williams a question or a line of questioning that it unearthed stuff that we've been wanting to know from Serena. We do not believe Serena <laughs> when she... <laughs> when she responded to him, but it's something that's been kind of left to speculation for the last few years. So do I get to be Serena? Or? No, you do not. <gasps> the last but time, that's the fun rule. No, but the last time I was Ben, when we did a Ben thing. Really? Yeah. I had to be Ubaldo. You speak Italian. But he was speaking English. I'm, I've already practiced. Fine. I don't know what to tell you. Okay. You mentioned not playing a match since September. You haven't played any post-U.S. Open tournaments since 2014. Really? 2014? Yes. No, I don't believe that. I need evidence. It's right. No. It means you're pretty committed to the schedule. Time flies. What has that new sort of mode been like for you? Does it help shortening your season on your own? How does that set you up here? Maybe more rust but fresher? I don't know, to be honest. I actually did plan on playing the championships. I had no idea I was going to qualify. Thank God I didn't. I was so happy I didn't qualify. I was training through it. Oh man, I gotta be ready. So I would have played, but I didn't qualify. So that's the only thing. Yeah, so it's it's not on purpose. Every year I plan on playing Beijing. It just doesn't happen. Every year I try to qualify for the championships. Thankfully, I didn't last year. I'm telling you, I promise, it's by chance. You won the championships three times in a row. Exactly. I love going. I love supporting it. It's a great tournament. So it's literally by chance. Is it at all a goal this year? It's always a goal for me to make the championships. That's always my goal. The slams and the championships. Those are something that's super important to me. I have to say, Ben got through an entire sequence of questioning without phrasing a question as, I'm curious. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. I know but, when Ben asks a question in press because it has I'm curious. Yes. There. And the exchanges between them are not always that pleasant. No. Serena was in the mood that day. I got to tell you, like the brazenness to lie like that is just, it's wild. And nobody can do that like Serena. Her fans know. It's by chance. That she hasn't played in the fall since 2014? Girl, if you wanted to play Beijing, like you said, you would have played at least once. I do think there may be some truth to her possibly playing the championships if she back ended it into it. I think that's possible. Okay. I'm if, not going to say that she that says was, so. I'm not going to say that that was total bullshit. I mean, she made literally no effort to mm -hmm. qualify. But you don't not play. There's a lot of negatives there. You, you don't end up not playing Beijing five years in a row. By happenstance. <laughs> yes, it, it does look uh, intentional to shut down the season after the U.S. Open, which is fine. 
if that's your choice. I was just struck that she was so insistent that it was purely accidental. She is just one of a kind. She weaves tales. She <laughs> weaves tales. Sam Query earlier in the week said that he will not be playing the Olympics. And this is in keeping with Isner and some of the other American men who kind of scoff and make it seem kind of asinine that they would want to play the Olympics. Mm. Uh, John Isner takes Atlanta money instead of playing the Olympics. <laughs> Why not? He, does. he probably gets a big appearance fee. He says he would rather win a Masters, Indian Wells, or Miami. I don't know about Rome or something like that, though. Like, ugh, God. Like, listen. Sam is always trying to go for that ugly American stereotype. It's just a goal that he frequently reaches. But, Why wouldn't you want to win your own? But listen, these are the guys who, as Trumpers... Well, we don't, we don't know that for certain as speculated, with Sam. As speculated Trumpers. Or at least people who have, you know, aligned themselves with the role of patriot. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, that's fair. <laughs> there is no greater role historically in sport. Davis Scott, maybe, in tennis. I'll give right. him that. Which has more tradition in yeah, tennis. But historically in sport, there's no greater patriotic role for one to play than to represent one's country at the Olympic Games. Mm. So this disconnect... I find to be akin with uh, a touch of xenophobia, which we see manifested Mm. in this whole, I'll win something, just not Rome or something like that. I'll win an American Masters. It's like John Isner. Not one of the most venerable tournaments in tennis history. John Isner going to a country with impeccable cuisine and saying he can't find McDonald's or burgers or pizza. (laughs) You know, like... He's like... Uh, this carbonara is, it's fine. Like, it, it's fine. But they don't have any goddamn chicken McNuggets like I like it. It's uh, it's something that I do not understand, but I understand. If you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I see what's going on here. We joke. I don't, I don't think that a player should have to play the Olympics if they don't want to. I wonder, though, like, where is the evidence that Sam would or could win one of those Masters <laughs> events. <laughs> yeah. like, like, where is he getting it? You know? Sorry, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, to be fair to him, that question was, would you rather win the Olympics or a Masters? Kind uh-huh. of thing. Uh-huh. But in the absence of evidence that you could win Indian Wells or Miami, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Just a quick update or reminder on the GoFundMe. If you have sent us your address, you've been added to the list. If you donated $50 or more, please send us your address and we will send you a postcard. If you've donated 75 or more, you are eligible for the BodyServe swag bag. Mm-hmm. Which includes a BodyServe tote with the logo on it. It's cute. A BodyServe notepad, as well as a BodyServe pen. You are also eligible for a drawing of a Rizzo print, a gorgeous print of either Serena Williams or Simona Halep from Tom Humberstone. Also $75 if you've contributed that much. If you've contributed $100, you're eligible for or signed, authenticated Bianca Andrescu tennis ball from the Rogers Cup 2019 that comes in its own square case. It's secured. And it also has a certificate of authenticity, which is to say everybody's eligible for these prizes. We just had to put a cutoff somewhere. And if you say, for example, contributed $40, if you can still contribute $35 and you'll now be eligible for the the prizes or whatever. Right. The GoFundMe, while we're not promoting it on social media, it's still active. It'll be active through the end of the Australian Open. Uh, a couple days after we release or or wrap episode. Uh, thank you to everybody who has contributed to the GoFundMe. You have you've made our year already. I mean, it's it's beyond our <laughs> wildest dreams and imaginations. And if you sent us an email with uh, your address already, I know you said this, but I want to reiterate that while we haven't been able to respond to everybody. And acknowledge receipt of your address we got it you be rest assured you're added to the list and uh 
we'll start distributing those post Australian Open. Yeah. So you can contact us at thebodyserve at gmail.com through uh, the Podbean website or thebodyserve.com. You can also connect with us on Twitter at thebodyserve, Instagram, same. I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR on Twitter. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan at tennis underscore John. This has been a week, and we expect to have another week <laughs> with the second half of the Australian Open. We hope you enjoy the episode. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.